Stanford University. I think the greatest challenge we face uh, at the moment is the provision of adequate food, water, and energy for the population of the globe so that everybody can have what we would regard as a decent lives. And this has to be done in the face of population rising from six and a half billion today to nine or 10 billion in the middle of the century, the threat of climate change, and at some time, the decline in the availability of fossil fuels. Now, energy, of course, is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself, but I think it's a necessary means. With six and a half billion people, uh, and over half of them living in big cities, and that fraction is going up and will continue to go up as the population goes up. Going back to the pre-industrial age where we just live on human and animal muscle power is not, I believe, an option. So I think if we're going to solve the water and energy problems, we've really got to look at uh, energy, and that's the key problem. Should look at it as a holistic way, the people moving to cities, water, food, uh, but I'm going to focus on energy. But I'll just give you two examples of the difficulty you can get into if you don't think holistically. A few years ago, there was a big enthusiasm about biofuels, and people like the International Energy Agency were making huge claims for what they could do. And at that time, I looked into that, and the, about 1% of the world's transport, road transport was powered by biofuels, and it was being grown on about 1% of the agricultural land. It's up to about 2% now. But you can immediately figure out from that, it can't go to 100% unless we stop eating, or we bring in more land, which will need water, or we develop more um, eff uh, efficient biocrops, which we should do. But that figure tells you it's not going to be a panacea. But the people working on it somehow weren't thinking about the food and other issues. Another example is with solar power. A lot of talk about concentrated solar power. But this needs cooling towers. Now, you can cool with air, but then you lose 10% or more efficiency. But I just see that the first, where, where there is a lot of sun, and usually there isn't so much water. And there's a first law case going on in Nevada where people are trying to build a, I think it's a 300 or 250 megawatt concentrated solar power plant, and it's going to take 20% of the groundwater, and the farmers are in the court trying to stop it happening. So we shouldn't think of these things in isolation. Nevertheless, I'm going to do it and talk about energy. So I want to start with a few facts, which are probably known to most of you. We lose, you use a lot of energy very unevenly. We're using at a rate of 16 terawatts. Very hard to grasp that number. But if you divide it by the population of the world, you get easier to understand. The world average is 2.4 kilowatts per person. In other words, we're using up energy at the equivalent of burning 24 old-fashioned 100-watt incandescent light bulbs for every man, woman, and child on the planet, continuously. In the US, it's about four times as much. Uh, and in Bangladesh, per person, it's about a 50th as in the US. So it's very uneven, and we're using a lot of energy. Note, if you don't know it, that electricity production only accounts for about a third of primary energy use. Most energy talks focus on electricity, and I will do the same. And I think that's legitimate because electricity use is rising, and in fact, more or less everything we do, we could do with electricity, except for flying, maybe. Even then, we could synthesize biofuels if we wanted to. We produce a lot of CO2. It's in proportion to the energy, but not quite. China is below the world average in energy, but above it in CO2, and that's because they rely on coal much more than everybody else. World energy use by the International Energy Agency thinks it'll go up 40% by 2030. We don't need more. We can all do with less. But it's needed to lift billions of people out of poverty in the developing world. And 80% of the world's energy is generated by burning fossil fuels, oil, coal, gas, which is causing potentially catastrophic climate change, horrendous pollution, and unsustainable in the long run because they're certainly not there forever, although we can argue about how long it is. So I want to elaborate on this question about the developing world and where the energy comes from, and then look at the timescales to worry with these problems, and then the actions, including fusion, developing fusion. So this is a map of the world. It's a bit out of date, 2006. I think it's 1.5 billion people today lack electricity. And those people, it's not a camping holiday. They are spending 
huge amounts of time fetching fuel, fetching water, and it's mainly children and it's, uh, who are not being educated and women who are not being productively employed. Just to show you that this is not a picnic, this is a map of different areas in Tanzania, and it shows the average distance that someone in each household is walking every day to collect fuel to cook. So in this area, someone in every house is walking, on average, 10 kilometers, five out, five back, with a load of average 20 kilos to collect fuel. So these people are having a miserable time, to put it mildly. Now, something about the developing world. This plot here, up this axis, is something called the Human Development Index. It's a proxy for the standard of living used by the, uh, by the United Nations. So this is mixture of life expectancy at birth, that accounts for a third, adult literacy and school enrollment, that's another third, and gross national product per person at purchasing power parity, what you buy, not what the bank gives you. Actually, it's the logarithm of this, so you'd be interested to know the United Nations only thinks that Bill Gates is logarithmically better off than the rest of us. <laughs> so on this scale, this is misery, and that's supposed to be bliss. And along here is the average primary energy demand per person, measured in tons of oil equivalent. Of course, it's not all oil, but that's the amount of oil you would need. And on here is every country in the world. The red countries are the OECD countries. And you can see up here it's more or less flat. The standard of living, as measured by this proxy, is rather independent. So us up here, I think this is the US, and the UK is about here, we could probably come down. There are people using a lot of energy and having a miserable time. That's another question. But the problem is here, in the developing world, the standard of living as measured by this is more or less proportional to the amount of energy. And this is where most of the population live. And you can do the following calculation. You can say, supposing I set a goal to get everybody up to 0.9, and this suggests we need to get to three tons of oil equivalent, what would it cost in energy to bring all these people up to the, th the shoulder? And you can do the calculation with every country. This is where everyone lives. You've got to do it point by point. And the answer is, to bring everybody up here, we'd have to double the energy use of the world. That's with today's population. The population in 2030, which we know pretty well what it'll be, 2.6-fold. I think that's impossible. It would help if we all came down but there's not so many of us. Even if we all converge here, we'd have to put up the energy use 1.8 today, 2.4 in 2030. So if we're going to get any sort of equity in the world, we're all going to have to get used to living with you know, something which is below the shoulder down here. So this is a real challenge. And it's in our interest, not only a moral interest, but for security too, to see that people down here are having a decent life. Now, where does our energy come from? These are well-known figures. Um, actually, they're not rounded anymore. I was using rounded. So this is the percentage of primary energy from different sources. But I've put it into thermal equivalent, because hydro, uh, I mean, nuclear and fossil fuels produce heat. So if you turn them into electricity, about a third of that goes into electricity. Hydro produces electricity. So for hydro vanished, you'd have to have about three times as much You'd have to have 6% more fossil fuel to replace it. So I multiplied this up by 3, and about half of this is electricity. So I multiplied that up half of that by 3, and then I renormalized it you know, to bring it back to 100%. So that's in thermal equivalent energies. And you can see, if you think that we can replace fossil fuels by this line here, it's got to go up a factor of 60. So that's quite challenging. The energy use is, of course, very varied. Coal, which is globally is 33% of 77%, of so it's about 20, 25%, is 64% in China. That's why they produce more coal, and that's why they have so many people dying of air pollution, although it's quite a lot in the US, typically 10 years loss of life. Now, what's the time scale for the end of fossil fuels? There's an old Saudi saying, my father rode a camel, I drive a car, my son flies a plane, his son will ride a camel. Is it true? Maybe. Uh, there's a huge debate out there about peak oil. So rather than giving my own opinion, 
the, the, the UK Energy Research Centre just published a thick volume in which they've surveyed the whole world's literature on this, and I've thrown away all the older references. You can download this on the web. And they come up with the conclusion that the so-called, I think you all know about the peak, that oil, when you reach about half the original resources, you found the oil that's easy to fi find, so the second half's harder, and the pressure's dropping, and the oil will go up and then start coming down. And there's a huge debate where the peak is. These, some people think we're there. These people say that it's, it's likely to be before 2030 and significant risk before 2020, after which production is going to fall. With economics paying more, you can slow it down, of course. So maybe the sun is going to be setting on, on the oil industry. There's a lot of unconventional oil, uh, but of course this is pretty nasty stuff, and I'm not going to give an opinion how much we can or should use. I'm not clear of how much of this we can use. I'm sure we, we probably shouldn't be using. So there isn't that long to get used to there being no oil around. I personally think that this is sooner rather than later. Gas, uh, you look it up and it says there's 130 years of known and expected conventional gas. But that's with current use. International Energy Agency right now is predicting 1.5% growth, but that's since the economic slump and because they're trying to get us to lose less energy. It was going up a lot faster than that. And what, you know, an, an exponential bites into things, it turns it into 73 years. But there's been a huge expansion of unconventional gas, shale gas, tight gas, coal methane gas. It's snuck up and people took people by the surprise. Until two years ago, I was saying, this is next. Now I'm not so sure. Coal, it's often said there's no problem. There's over 200 years. But there's a group of people led by Dave Rutledge, who's the head of the engineering faculty at Caltech, who say that's a factor of two too big, even at current use. Dave actually thinks there's so little fossil fuel, we don't have to worry about climate change. He says all the IPC scenarios of CO2 going up are not possible. There's not enough carbon left to be burned. But I'd, I'm not sure about that at all. I, I'm going to worry. But with growth, IEA thinks 1.9%, 200 years turns into 115 years. And note that when the oil goes, the first thing we're going to do is start turning coal into oil and gas into oil. We're not going to give up our automobiles. Uh, so these growth rates are going to increase. So sometime in the coming century, we're going to face a big crunch, and with oil, relatively soon. Now, on the, whatever you think, if it's 50 years, 30 years, we've been accumulating fossil fuels for 300 million years, and it's just a little like blip in the history of mankind, and the fossil fuels will be gone. Now, what about avoiding climate change? The CO2 stays up there for maybe five, six, seven hundred years. I mean... It's a long time. I personally can't imagine that we're not going to burn the rest of the fossil fuels. It's just cheaper than everything else if you don't worry about killing people with pollution and uh, climate change. It's cheaper. I don't imagine, I, I find it hard, maybe I'm too cynical, but I don't imagine we're going to renounce fossil fuels. So it's going to be burned on a time scale short compared to how long it stays in the atmosphere, I guess which means I believe we really have to make every effort for carbon capture and storage. Uh, taking the carbon out of the carbon power plant, there are three different ways of doing it, compressing it and putting it underground. Uh, this should be developed as a matter of urgency, but it's not yet proven on a big scale. Bits are shown on a small scale. I noticed that uh, Obama just announced a task force to come up with proposals for, I think, 10 different trials. You need to try the different technologies and different geologies. And the European Union's just announced four billion going into this. But I believe this is a matter of urgency to test the different combinations of geology and technology. And if it works, roll it out. The problem is that's easy to say, but it puts the cost up by several cents a kilowatt hour. Initially, quite a lot, maybe four or five cents. Uh, so, you know, that's easy to say, hard to do. So what should we be doing? Efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. There's lots of low-hanging fruit out there. Develop and expand low-carbon sources, uh, and I'll come back to that, and devise economic tools and ensure the political will to make this happen and change our behavior. All these things I think we should be starting to do worrying about the end of fossil fuels and using the fossil fuels for better things like 
you know, making plastics and so on. But they're also the right steps for climate change. So if you're a skeptic about climate change, and I am not, you will be, I think you should be supporting these moves anyway. The only thing you wouldn't do is carbon capture. If you don't believe in climate change, no point. Might as well just burn the stuff. Now, the use of energy, these are rounded global figures. It's roughly 25% in industry, 25% in transport, and 50 in buildings. This doesn't include industrial buildings, but it does include uh, things like uh, the freezers in the supermarket, the computers in this building, all that sort of stuff. But you see the big ones, industry is pretty inclined to go for the, you know, save, save money. So you can res rely on them to keep their costs down, try to be efficient. But the big ones are transport and the built environment. This, I don't know the US figure, but in uh, the UK domestically, we we're in transport and we got houses. It's about 30%. And I think that's probably true here. So what we do individually matters. We are producing, using a lot of the energy. Uh, I'm going to put one slide on buildings. There's a lot to be done, but there's a great deal in transport. If you want to talk on energy efficiency, Bert Richter from Slack, my old colleague, uh, he led a, an American Physical Society group that did a wonderful report on energy efficiency last year, focusing on buildings and transport. But just on buildings, uh, improvements in design can cut energy use by an enormous amount, of course. But the turnover of the housing stock is slow. People don't knock their houses down every year. So this has, and retrofitting is quite an expensive way to do it. So this is a slow business. But lighting, people laugh if you say so, save power by turning the lights out. But lighting actually uses 19% of electricity worldwide. So we shouldn't be making rooms like this. We should have more natural lighting. So it can be done by design and more efficient bulbs. Incandescent bulbs are 5% efficient. Uh, light emitting diodes are about 50%. And the study to which I just alluded says that by upgrading residential incandescent bulbs and the ballasts in, you know, in um, uh, strip lighting uh, could save 3% of electricity use in the U US. That's quite a lot. So it's not trivial, this moving to modern light bulbs, which we in my country have to do by legislation can't buy incandescent bulbs anymore. There's a few left, and people are rushing around looking for them, <laughs> or flying back with them from the US, maybe. <laughs> Different voltage, probably blow up. Now, the low carbon sources, this is going to be the most uh, controversial thing, because I know there are people at Stanford who claim you can get 32 terawatts of electricity from the wind. I do not believe it, and I'm going to tell you why. So I've tried to estimate the most you can get from different sources and check if it makes sense from the point of view of physics. So geothermal, if I, I'm not talking about geothermal mining, where you take out heat and then you have to replace it. Uh, or actually, I am in that figure. But you can ask how much renewable geothermal can you can get. And it's known the flux of heat out of the Earth's surface is 10 terawatts. And that's all over the place. It's happening here, but to a small degree. So you're not going to get a lot from renewable geothermal. It's good in some countries, and there's a point I want to make here. These, 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 uh, just because something is not a big player globally doesn't mean it's not a big player locally. I was at a conference in India, and the president of Iceland was there, and he kept saying, why are you guys worrying? We can get everything from geothermal energy. This is true in Iceland, and it's true in Kenya, but it's not true anywhere else in the world. So the flux out of the Earth is only 10 terawatts, and it's everywhere. So you know, you're not going to get much. Hydro, um, you can work out the average, you can look up, actually, the average precipitation on the land, the average height of the Earth's surface above uh, the sea level, and work out the energy you know, that you can get if you get all of it back. And it's 34 terawatts. So uh, you know, I think. This is the additional, so I actually took, the, and this is thermal equivalent, so I multiplied it up by a factor of three. I took for the additional somewhat bigger than what the International Energy Agency thinks is the maximum you can possibly get. But, sorry, the maximum you can economically get, somewhat less than the maximum you can theoretically get. So that probably this is an upper limit. Now the wind, why don't I believe this uh, 72 terawatts? Uh, you can do the following calculation. Uh, we know that the kinetic energy in the wind is coming out of the sun. So the power is going in from the sun. 
And you can't get out more than you put in. Okay? So, uh, well, if you took out a huge amount, maybe more would go in. But Right, so we know that about two, somewhat less than 2% of the solar power ends up in the wind. So we know the power going into the wind. Then uh, we've got to divide that by three to be on or close to the land. And that's generous because the wind is blowing more out in the oceans. Then you've got to divide it by two because the most you can get is 50% electri- efficiency into electricity. And you're left at that point with 400 terawatts. And then you can ask, what fraction of that can you get? And if you do the calculations, say if you put windmills you know, 100 meters, taking it all out of 100 meters out of a 10 kilometer atmosphere, which isn't quite right because the velocity is higher, but the density is not uniform. That's 1%, you get 4 terawatts. So I don't understand how people who plaster the earth with windmills think they can get 70 terawatts. And I think it's because if you put too many windmills, you change the boundary conditions, and you push the wind up from the surface. So these are my numbers, and you add up to about 7 terawatts, and I think that's really pushing it compared to 13 terawatts today from fossil fuels and growing. I think with efficiency we can curb the growth, but if we want the people in Africa and India to have power, I doubt we can get an increase. So we've got a gap of five terawatts. So that brings me to the things I haven't mentioned, solar and nuclear. So um, solar, there's lots of it out there. If you put on half uh, half of 1% of the world's land surface, 50% occupied, you've got to walk between the stuff, Plus some systems that turned it into electricity with 15% efficiency, you get 19 terawatts. That's more than world use, and this is electricity, not thermal equivalent. Now, that's quite a lot of land, of course, but photovoltaics with 15% efficiency exist. They're expensive, and the sun doesn't shine at night, even in sunny California. So you need storage. So we've got to bring the cost down and get storage. I'll come to this in a minute. There's also photosynthesis, which is a form of solar power, but even sugar cane is only 1% efficient at producing energy, and wood is about a sixth of that. So this is way down. I mean, you'd have to take 15% of the world's surface to get 19 terawatts. That's a lot. But maybe we can get the efficiency of biofuels up. There's an exciting idea of artificial photosynthesis. I won't talk about that. So the way ahead is... Here could be photovoltaics, presumably with hydrogen storage, or concentration, as in the Mojave Desert, which has the advantage that you're heating up um, molten salts here, and they have thermal inertia, so they stay hot after the sunset, and you can store them and keep, keep it. So this, I think, but Richter was telling me this morning I'm crazy, and this is always going to be too expensive, but the potential is there. In principle, this can make it, and I don't think any other of the renewables can. So I'm sure we must put money into that. Then nuclear. I believe we should expand it dramatically now. The next generation of reactors is, have fewer components, passive safety, less waste, more proliferation resistant, etc. There's lots of uh, there's designs out there. But... Uh, Looking to the future, uh, we need to consider, if we're going to expand it, what are the problems? Uh, Where I come from, snail's pace of planning permission, though that's changing, perceptions of of safety, waste, proliferation, and uranium resources. So I want to say a word about these things. First of all, on safety, I believe it's perception. The figures are in a modern coal power plant in European population densities, a one gigawatt, that's a big power plant, but not the biggest, is causing through lung disease about 300 premature deaths a year. That's typically 10 years loss of life. So these people don't know that they were killed because of ingestion of those particles. They just know they died from lung disease. Any more than the people who die of radiation know it comes from Chernobyl rather than natural background. But if you multiply this up, 300 deaths, let's say, for 30 years, that's 9,000 people. That's more than the estimates of radiation deaths from Chernobyl. There's been one Chernobyl. There's lots of one gigawatt power stations. Of course, 50 people die directly at Chernobyl, but 7,000 die in coal mining accidents in China every year. And it's about 30 every year in this country. 
Waste, the problem is the volume. Here's the figures for Yucca Mountain. If you run the existing fleet into the ground, you've got more than will go into Yucca Mountain. And if you expand it, you've got a lot more than will go into Yucca Mountain. And proliferation, we need to limit the availability of enrichment technology, etc. So uh, what about the resources? It's a controversial subject. Conventional, uh, we know of about 3 million tons of conventional uranium. And the estimates agree that there's up to 60 million. And up to this a year or so ago, I was ignoring what's called unconventional uranium. There's a lot out there, a very low concentration in the seawater, for example. Uh, but it's very expensive to get out. And it's expensive in energy as well as money. So, however, it turns out, according to the uh, IEA, IEAA's Red Book, that it looks as if you can get quite a lot of uh, uh, 22 million tons from phosphates as a byproduct phosphoric acid puts this up to 38 million. I should say the nuclear people are schizophrenic about these numbers. Half the time they tell us there's lots of uranium, they can solve the problems for the indefinite future. And when they want R&D money to make more efficient reactors, they tell us we're going to run out shortly. So uh, we have to make up our minds here. Now, um, so there's a lot out there, and we can pay a lot more for it if we want. It, it's marginal in the cost. And um, we, we can use it more efficiently with fast breeder reactors. With 60 million tons, at present use, that's for 200 years. 38 million tons, 475. That looks a lot, but if nuclear is going to increase, supposing we got all our electricity from nuclear, these, num these times get much shorter. So there is quite a lot of time out there, but it isn't there forever. So we do have to be thinking about if there's going to be a big expansion of fusion, uh, how to develop fast breeder reactors, which get 60 times more energy per kilo, or uh, slow breeder reactors with thorium. And we have to think about different fuel cycles where we try to make the, the waste in a form it, it's smaller volume, so you can get it all in Yucca Mountain, or it's let more proliferation resistant, etc. So let me now come to fusion. I'm not going to say anything about inertial confinement fusion. Somebody might like to ask a question about that. But the answer is going to be it's 20 years behind and doesn't have anything like as good hope as this. I'm prepared to defend that when somebody asks the question. So fusion powers the sun. So it works. And this experiment in Europe uh, at the lab of which I was director for five years produced in 1997 16 megawatts of fusion power but for a short period. Uh, it's not produced more power since then because if you run it with tritium to make power, you make the walls radioactive and it's not so good as an experimental device and you don't want to do that. So it works. The question is, can we make it or when can we make it work reliably and economically on the scale of a power station? This isn't big enough to have a net production of power. So first, what is it? So the most effective fusion process involves fusing deuterium and tritium. So you heat up a gas, and at a few thousand degrees, the collisions between the molecules knock off the electrons, and it becomes what's called a plasma, separated nuclei and electrons. But when the nuclei approach each other, they're Coulomb force, the electrical repulsion, they just bounce off. But as you make it hotter and hotter, they get closer and closer, until at this temperature, they get close enough they can merge and rearrange liberating, because this has a lot of negative energy, it's tightly bound, uh, very energetic helium and neutrons. So I've got a slide of this. So this shows deuterium and tritium, just a Coulomb collision. They bounce off each other. And then, but uh, this is supposed to have sound, but it's not switched on. That was slowed down. This is the correct relative velocities. So this is the Coulomb collision. And this is the uh, fusion, like that. So a great deal of energy comes out. You've got to heat this. This temperature is 10 times the temperature of the core of the sun. So you've got to find a way of heating up a very large volume of gas and preventing it touching the walls. It'll hurt the walls, but it'll cool the gas down if you do that, and the fusion fire will go out. That you have to do with a magnetic bottle called a tokamak, Toradolnia cameras of magnetnami katushkami, for those who speak Russian. Uh, and it's been done. This we do every day at JET. 
we get to, and a lot of other fusion devices, at D3D at General Atomics near San Diego. So this temperature we've got. So the challenge is make a magnetic fossil. It's sort of done, but maybe we'd like to get higher pressure, gets bigger fusion reaction, and we've got to hold it for much longer. We've got to make a robust container because the neutrons uh, damage the walls and a reliable system. That's probably the biggest challenge. So this is what it'll look like. There'll be a toroidal system. This is a magnet round here with a lot of gas in it, very low density. It's about a millionth of the density of the atmosphere, but it's about a million times atmospheric temperature. So it's about one atmosphere in pressure, which is one of the reasons there's actually rather little danger. There's not all that much stored energy to get out in it. And you've got to heat it up and keep it there. You need about two or 3,000 cubic meters of this gas, and jet was about 100. It's not enough to get a, a real net production. The neutrons fly out into the wall where they do two things. The neutrons hit lithium in the wall, which is the raw fuel, and there's, there's a reaction. Neutron plus lithium makes tritium, which you feed back again. So you need some tritium to get it started, but then it makes its own tritium. This has never been done. ITER will test it, but the nuclear physics has been known for 60 years. No doubt that it will work. The question is, can you get the tritium out without too much staying behind and stuff like that? It's got to be done. And the neutrons are stopped in the wall. They heat the wall up, and then it's like any thermal power station. There's a cooling circuit and a secondary circuit, and you boil water and drive turbines. So this is like any thermal power plant, but with a different fuel and a different furnace. Why bother? It's complicated, it's difficult, it's expensive, probably. The reason is you need so little fuel. So there is lithium in the battery of this laptop. And you can ask, if I took the lithium in one laptop battery and used it to make electricity, how much electricity could I get? Actually, this is about five years ago, and lithium batteries have got more efficient, but anyway. <laughs> Five years ago, with those lithium batteries, the figure was allowing for all the thermal inefficiencies, anything you want, from the lithium in one laptop battery and half a bathtub of water, you could provide 200,000 kilowatt hours. That is a lot of energy. In this country, it's the per capita electricity production for 15 years. So the lithium in one laptop battery will provide your personal needs and your share of the use of industry, street lighting, etc. This fact alone tells me, until we find it impossible, we've got to give this a go. This and the other facts that I'm just coming to. There's essentially unlimited fuel. There is lithium in seawater at 100 times the concentration of uranium. And you can get it out. There's enough to power fusion for a million years, if we can get it to work. No CO2, intrinsic safety, and the product's helium and a neutron that's absorbed. But when the neutron hits the wall, it gets stopped and it induces nuclear reactions which can make the wall radioactive. But you can choose the materials in the wall in such a way that the species that you produce have half-lives of 10 years, let's say, and uh, you can recycle them in 100 years. We think you can do that, but the materials need to be developed. And maybe there's a competitive electricity price. I'll come back to that. The disadvantages are the, blank, the walls do become radioactive, but as I've said, it's not a problem for intergenerational problem, and we need more research and development. You need plasma volumes for physics arguments. If I had five more minutes, I could explain. Uh, at least 10 times out of jet. This is ITER, in fact. So, uh, and this is one of the reasons it's been so slow. There are three reasons, the answer to this thing, why is fusion always 30 years ahead? Uh, the first is you cannot demonstrate it on a small scale. If in the 19th century I'd wanted to convince you to invest in a coal power plant, I could have made a coal power plant the size of my fist. You just boil a cup of water, make steam, drive a, a miniature turbine. This won't work except on the gigawatt scale. So to demonstrate it, you've got to spend billions. And society is not going to spend billions until they're pretty sure it will work. So you have a chicken and egg problem. So progress has been slow and cautious. We've never taken the next step until reasonably confident. 
It's not been funded with any urgency. I was looking at a US study from the middle 70s which said that with enough money, they could have a demonstrator fusion power plant up and running about today. So people remember that and say, you guys failed. But they forget the qualification with enough money. It then says with 20% less, it'd be another 15 years. With 30% less, another 35 years. And then there's a level you never converge. And the US fusion budget has been at that level. And the final thing is, it is very hard. You have to keep this huge volume of gas to 10 times hotter than the sun. You have to find robust materials. And the biggest challenge, you have to ensure reliability. Nevertheless, a lot of progress. This is the, the, the basic principle of the magnetic bottle, the tokamak, was demonstrated in 1969. And this is the same size as jet. So from 1969, from 3 million degrees, we've come to 150 million degrees. And this step in scale. But of course, 1969 is a long time ago. The progress, I don't have time to go into that. This is the 1968 plot at a time when people weren't believing the Russians, but they were right. Uh, in temperature, we've come from here up to the region we want to be into. And this is the pressure times the time in which the energy stays in the system and doesn't leak out. And you can make a power plant, you've got to get here. So we've come up you know, about five orders of magnitude this way. And this step here, simply by building a device twice as big, for geometrical reasons, you're going to get here, unless there's a big negative surprise. And I could discuss if someone wants to ask what that surprise could be. So the next steps are to build this thing called ETA, which will get 10 times as much energy out as in. There's things to be done meanwhile. And in parallel with that, you need, we need intensified research and development on the materials. And we need a, a test device to test the materials. Because you're not going to get a fusion power station licensed until you show that the materials will stand up to the bombardment. But you can only get the bombardment by building a fusion power station. So you seem to have a chicken and egg problem. But you can build an accelerator system, which will produce in a small volume uh, neutrons with the right flux and the right energy. And you can test that at least the materials will work. But that's not the same as establishing the reliability. ETA, by the way, I haven't put JET on here to scale, but here's the human being here. And if I go back, did I have a human being? Yeah, here, here, no, there's no, yeah, here's the human being on JET. And when we're going to ETA, it's like that. And it's a global response to a global problem. These countries that are in ETA uh, house more than half the world's population and have about 70 or 75% of the world's gross uh, national product. So this is the world getting together saying, this is pretty expensive. We're not certain it will work, but we're damn certain we better give it a try. Because if it does work, it could be very helpful. Um, people have studied if fusion works, uh, what might the power cost? Now, you might well say, Look, you haven't built ETA yet, and that's going over budget, so how could you believe these numbers? Actually, the people who made these studies always said that ETA was wrongly costed, funnily enough. So you shouldn't take these too seriously, but they say for early models, which are rather little extrapolation on ETA and use water-cooled steel, uh, oxide dispersion uh, steel, strengthened steel of a certain type, uh, they come up with 9 euro cents a kilowatt hour, and for advanced models, 5 cents. I don't take these numbers seriously, but the point is they're not five euros or five dollars. If they were, I would not have been working in fusion. These numbers are not stupid. Whether they can be achieved is another matter. The economics of fusion, just as you can't test it on a small scale, the economics become more and more favorable the bigger it is. These numbers were for one and a half gigawatt output power stations. The grid doesn't like very big power stations, because if one goes down, there's a problem, although people are building stations that are bigger than one and a half gigawatts. If you went to three gigawatts, these prices would come down about 30%. It's capital intensive, but costs almost nothing to, to run, so there's lots of off-chief peak power. How long could it be? Well, it's very easy to work out. If we assume that in parallel with building ETA, we get on with the materials work and developing the technologies uh, then, if we build ETA in 10 years, 
We'll operate it for about 10 years to get the courage to build a real power station, and then it'll take about 10 years to build a power station. So I'm afraid it is 30 years till we can uh, have a demonstrator, and then it's the second half of the century. It's light for climate change, but it's fine for the end of fossil fuels. Uh, the real challenge is going to be the reliability. I'm pretty certain we could make a fusion power station. The question is, could we make it work more than 5% of the time? You have to remember that in nuclear fission, which is just a box of burning nuclei, in the 1970s, the average availability, working time, of nuclear power stations was about 45%. Today, it's up at 90%. This is much more complicated. But technology moves on. I can't prove to you we can make it work reliably, but I don't think you can prove to me that it won't. And I would say, if, somebody, if you'd seen the, watching the Wright brothers and somebody had shown you a picture of a jumbo jet, you would have said, I'm, you're joking. Technology does move on. So uh, I think I should be finishing and allowing time for questions. Can it add up to a solution, all these energies? Known technologies, I think, could in principle, in principle, meet our needs until the middle of the century, maybe. Uh, but then it's got to go on coming down to keep us on a stabilized trajectory. So actually, we're going to need something out there like fusion. But it's going to be very, very hard. And if I'd had more time, I would have gone into this. I don't know if any of you read this. But the International Atomic Energy Agency every year produces a book called The World Energy Outlook. And this year, it's got a big chapter saying, this is how we can keep below 450 parts per million of carbon dioxide. And it's a very dangerous book, because it doesn't say, and this is technically possible, but almost impossible to imagine happening. And it's given people a feeling of complacency. Well, the first point is it doesn't actually keep it to 450 parts. It goes above it. Secondly, it only gives you measures up to 2030, which are technically possible, but near the limit of believability. It's no suggestion of what will happen after that, when we'll need more measures. And there's still a lot of fossil fuels, with carbon capture in there, which isn't proved yet. And there's not much headroom for getting more equity. So the report gives a misleadingly optimistic impression. I could go through that, and I've got slides of it, but I'm running out of time. But let me give you an, just two final things. Why I think this is misleading. Some of you may read The Economist. It's quite an influential journal. It's always been awful on energy. And the editor for 93 to 2006 now writes freelance in the Sunday Times, uh, the London Times. And he wrote an article claiming there's no need to worry about CO2. It'll take care of itself. And he had read the World Energy Outlook and not understood it. What he said was, uh, there's no need to worry. If China carries on its stated course, its stated program, it'll only produce 7 gigatons instead of 11 gigatons CO2 previously predicted. He just didn't read it. The 11 gigatons is with all the measures already agreed in principle by China, but not actually done. 11 gigatons is really hard. This one is almost impossible, technically. So I think that the fact that the IAEA didn't put a health warning in there is dangerous. I want to make one final remark. Again, this is the same statement. We've got to go everything. There isn't a, a um, silver bullet. And one, one of the questions you can ask is, why is some of this not happening? Because with increased efficiency, we can save money. Some of you may have seen this graph produced by McKinsey. So this was for 2005, when the US was producing uh, six gigatons of CO2. And uh, so this is half the US production. And this is the cost per ton to, uh, saving a ton of CO2. So actually, according to this graph, the US can save about a quarter of its CO2 while making a profit. And this triangle is constructed to have the same area. So McKinsey say it's cost neutral to save half of the US's CO2. So why is it not happening? First of all, the idea you can buy these savings in here is ridiculous. Just because you save money somewhere doesn't mean you go and spend it somewhere else. And it's different people. 
Now, these are the obvious things. Better residential building lighting, electronics, fuel economy cars, blah, 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 blah. And then it gets more expensive. Solar PV, solar concentrated, etc. The reason this isn't happening is we're all affluent and we don't care if, you know. So some of this has got to be done through regulation. Building regulations and uh, regulations on emissions from cars. And it's got to be done with a serious cost in there. And the reason this isn't happening in the developing world, of course, is that some of these things need capital. And we're talking about people who, you know, to buy uh, one of these modern curly fluorescent bulbs, that's a serious outlay if you're living on a dollar a day, so they buy an incandescent bulb. So there's lack of capital to make the investment in the developing world, and in the developed world, we're too affluent. So all this needs, uh, I would like to see a carbon tax, but my American friends tells me that, tell me that's a sin to talk about taxation in this country. It's theft, uh, so talking about cap and trade, I'm not a, we have a cap and trade system in Europe, and I'm not at all convinced it will do the job because the price fluctuates, and it doesn't give the incentive. People are not going out and building, although carbon has been up to 30 euros a ton at one point, carbon dioxide in Europe, uh, that's enough to be worth building nuclear, and it's getting not so far off starting to build carbon capture. But nobody's doing it because the price goes up and down. So it needs certainty. So the final conclusion is there's a huge increase in energy use expected. A large increase is needed to lift the world out of poverty. It's going to be very, very difficult. There is no silver bullet. We need a portfolio um, approach. We need more, just because I said wind, hydro, etc., couldn't make it, doesn't mean I'm against it. We need more wind, hydro, biofuels, marine, and particularly carbon capture and storage. And for the long run, the only way we're going to make it when there's no fossil fuels is a lot of solar and nuclear, either fusion or, or fission or fusion. So we've got to develop it. There's a huge R&D agenda, and the R&D is pathetic. We're spending, the world's spending less R money on energy R&D today than it was in 1981 in real terms. Almost unbelievable, despite the energy market going up. And when people tell me ITER is expensive, you have to remember the world energy market, it depends on the cost of oil, so it changes every day. But it's of order $5 trillion a year. And publicly funded energy R&D, which is the only long-term part, is about $10 billion. So you can't see it on the $5 trillion scale. So we've got to be working on this. It needs fiscal incentives and regulation and the political will globally. It's no good having targets. My government has legislated, it's British law, but we're going to reduce our carbon dioxide 60% by 2050. So what? I mean, they haven't told us how they're going to do it. Uh, so the time for action is now. And if we don't act, there's a danger in the developing world of a Malthusian solution. Thank you very much. You mentioned that there was a negative surprise on scaling on the Takamak. Uh, well, it's not a surprise. It, it's very, very simple. Supposing you double the size of, from jet to eater, it's about double in every linear dimension, so it's eight times the volume. So it's eight times the volume, but only four times the surface area for the heat to leak out. And on average, the heat has got to travel twice as far. So the energy, the, the critical parameters up the left-hand axis were the pressure. If you double the fusion pressure, you get four times as much energy power, and we're increasing the pressure every day. The trick is to get the pressure out without inducing stabilities. But the other one is how fast the power leaks out, because you've got to put it back again. So it's the energy confinement time. If you double the size, the surface to volume gives you a factor of two, and the fact that the energy to get out has to travel twice as far. So you automatically get a factor of four. And with a bigger machine, you can put bigger electrical current through the plasma and make a stronger magnetic bottle. So that's why we're very confident, for geometrical reasons, ITER will be in that region. But it's also why anything smaller than ITER, just you, the power is leaking out too fast. You have to keep putting power back in to keep it burning. So it won't work. So you have to build big power stations. <laughs> Um, on your slide, uh, 
uh, showing the uh, potential of um, conventional sources yeah. to replace fossil fuels. Um, you alluded to and specifically talked about the limitations on each of them yeah. um, and the geographical uh, biases, so to speak. Um, is that, uh, that also discounts, uh, do you take into effect sort of uh, the, um, or do you ratio it, so to speak, to address the fact that, that much of that is in locations that are not where the demand is located? Okay. Uh, what I did was two things. I went and looked at the literature to find people who tried to estimate what is the maximum we think you can get. And, uh, and then I found this wind thing, which I didn't believe. Uh, and, that, uh, and those people look at the geography. Okay? And then, as a physicist, you want to do it on the back of an envelope. So I tried to calculate what's plausible. So I tried to calculate the maximum possible and then say, but surely you can't get more than 1% of that. That's why I was rather surprised by hydro, by the way. Uh, although it's conceivable I slipped a factor of 10 because there's huge numbers out there. And <laughs> but I don't think so. And uh, you can do a lot of these things. You can work out tidal dissipation from looking at the slowing down of the Earth and how often there's a leap second and stuff like that. But, but the wind is a very odd one, because there's several people who've done the calculation of putting windmills out there. Mind you, they, that uses 17% of the Earth's surface, so it's pretty hard to believe in the first place. But I'm not sure I believe it even then, because you know, we, know, uh, we know the power going into the wind. You can't take out more power than goes in. So you, you volunteer to comment about the inertial confinement and, uh, and, and why that, okay. think about why that doesn't scale. So uh, the inertial confinement, you've had a talk in the series from Ed Moses, I think. So you've certainly had the positive view. And I'm in favor of developing it, let me be uh, very clear. But if NIF works as advertised, which it hasn't yet, in five years they will get a shot with tritium that shot will produce 20 megajoules. Jet, which I showed you when it last ran seriously with tritium, produced a shot with 20 megajoules in 1997. So it's 20 years behind. Then you can ask, what is the energy gain? And Ed will tell you, the energy gain in Jet was around 1.8. I'm going to get a gain of 11. But that's a physicist gain which is not relevant. That's the energy into the plasma as heat uh, divided into the power out. It's not the wall plug power. Okay? Now, the wall plug, I'm going to cheat a little bit. In jet, actually, there's a lot of power in the magnets, which in future devices like ITER will be superconducting. So that's a technology we have, so I will ignore that. If I ignore that, the engineering gain in jet from the power from the wall plug to heat the plasma to the power out in the 1997 shot was a quarter. Not enough, it's got to be bigger. In NIF, lasers are very, very, very inefficient. He needs a big gain. He's got a gain of 11 for the physics gain, but the gain for wall plug is about 0 0.04. Then he's got the problem, those lasers fire once a week, and they've got to fire five times a second. And these little hole run devices that focus uh, cost several thousand dollars, they've got to cost a fraction of a dollar, like 20 cents. So probably means you can't use the whole ROM. You're going to have to go to um, uh, symmetrical systems with fast ignition, which is not what they're doing. So I don't want to knock it, <laughs> but if I had to put my money, I'd put it on, on, on this other system. It's quite a long way behind. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you comment on the prospects of uh, getting energy gain out of, um, say, the aneutronic uh, fuel cycles? Out of what? Aneutronic fuel cycles, say, more onto beryllium to uh, alpha particles, yes. for example. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. There's a company called TriAlpha which says it's going to make money with, I don't believe it. I, I, I don't really want to comment on that very much because it would you know, take me a bit of time to try and explain what it is, and I'd have to try and remember. But I did look at it very carefully. And uh, these are accelerator-driven systems, basically. Uh, so they're trying to they capture a hot plasma and send in uh, protons on. Uh, and it, it does, it, 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 it's a fusion reaction which doesn't produce neutrons, so you don't activate the walls. 
The trouble with that, though, is how are you going to get the energy out? The good thing about neutrons is they spread the energy out uniformly. So actually, they're an advantage in a way, advertise it as a disadvantage. I just don't believe the numbers in those things. I don't think they can work. It's a bit of a blunt comment. How about here, and then we'll go over to the next one. Yeah. Um, as I recall, for the first one or two generations of uh, attempts at fusion containment, uh, the, the theory this wasn't really fully adequate, yeah. and every time a new system was tried, a new instability meant to fuse. Yeah. Okay. Is that error behind us? I think so. What happened was, you know, when they finished building the bomb up, at, up on the hill at, at Los Alamos, uh, Fermi and company started thinking about fusion. And they all came home and said, well, that's going to be a bit nice, nice problem, a bit of physics. And they knew Maxwell's equations, so they thought that's enough. And they, they didn't realize, they didn't know about t uh, chaotic systems and that it would be turbulent. And in fact, there was a tremendous period of enthusiasm. And then they all went back to the drawing board. And the basic plasma physics, I mean, the hot shots in the 30s were working out, the physics in physics were working out the physics of nuclei and the physics of, of solids. They weren't worrying about plasmas. And in fact, the basic plasma physics, like the stuff that was worked out for solids, band theory and so on in the 30s, was only worked out in the 50s when, as a result of that failing. And now there's a much better understanding of turbulence. But it's still, I mean, it, it, these things don't work as well as they would if you neglected turbulence, that's for sure. And uh, people are doing big uh, um, simulations, but, you know, it seems to be okay. I wouldn't say it's perfect. I mean, there are things that can go wrong in ITER. Uh, I mean, to my mind, ITER is a systems engineering experiment. That's to say, almost everything in ITER has been used on some device in the world. There are superconducting machines, not as big as JET, not as big as ITER, certainly, etc. But they've never all been used at once. So this is putting it together and seeing, can you get it all work at once? And on a large enough scale, it's not big enough to make commercial power, but it's going to get a lot of power out. It will have power station conditions. Um, but, uh, and it'll be the first burning plasma. And in principle, there are problems that can happen in a burning plasma. Uh, for the physicists here, I mean, as the, you make these alpha particles, and as they slow down by collision, they heat up the gas. So you can turn off the poker that's keeping it hot. Just, you can turn it down. So it's self-sustaining. You actually don't want it burning. NIF has uh, got to ignite, otherwise they need a huge gang because the laser is so efficient. But here, you want to keep the gas poker in there so you can control the plasma. So you don't actually want it to burn, fully self-sustaining. Anyway, but as the, the alpha particle slows down, it does put heat back, but it goes through a speed which is the same as the speed of certain sine waves, alpha waves in plasmas, and it can couple to them so you can excite it instabilities. So it's conceivable that in a burning plasma, there are new instabilities. It's conceivable. But you can simulate that in other ways by injecting particles into existing devices, and you can do the theory. I'm not a plasma physicist. The plasma physicists tell me, well, it's conceivable, but it's sort of, you know, one in a thousand. So it's, it has, there's, plas there's plasma physics to be checked, let's say. Does it all work on the scale with a burning plasma? But it's mainly about systems integration and engineering. You talked about a 40 year path of commercialization based on yeah. adequate funding. Yeah. What's adequate funding? Uh, well, first thing is to get ETA um, funded properly. ETA turns out to be quite a lot more expensive than people thought for complicated reasons I won't go into. Though um, I remember when I was involved in the LHC actually reading that the Times of London had a supplement on big mega projects. You know, tunnel, channel, tunnel, that sort of stuff. And its op-ed piece ended, none of these big projects would ever have been funded if the proponents had not lied about the cost. <laughs> I don't think I lied about the LHC cost, but uh, anyway. So it, it is proving more expensive. Uh, I mean, the, the, the world fusion budget is about one and a half billion a year at the moment. If it went up to three billion, that would be fine. It's actually comparable to the high energy physics budget. It's much the same. I don't want to knock high energy physics, I'm a high energy physicist, but it's a completely different game, of course. And the other thing I'd say on that, I'd like to preach a little bit, the fact is, although I got the LHC approved, so 
particle physicists will hate this, it doesn't actually matter if we discover the Higgs boson this year, next year, or the year after, although we'd like to discover it, okay? We want progress. But for fusion, there's no point doing fusion badly. The worst thing you can do is have a fusion program that's underfunded. Complete waste of time. It's being done to produce energy. And the best thing is to do it quickly. Uh, if you look at the net present value, if you do it quickly and ITER fails, then you close the program and cut your losses. And if it works, you get the gain. I try this argument on the finance ministries of the world, but it doesn't work. <laughs> Give us a sense, like, how complex is Peter compared to another big physics experiment like LHC? Um, Does it kind of break down every few months? Like, kind of okay. Yeah. It's, it's very like, well, Norbert Hochkamp, who's the um, project leader, came out of high energy physics first, and then he was at Oak Ridge, built the spallation source. He says his device is more complicated than the LHC, and that it may be true. The, the LHC itself is a sort of evolutionary line. Um, but the detectors are another matter. Uh, I mean, I think, and, and, and in fact, but I mean, one of the problems with ITER, it's not like a particle physics detector. If you build one of these big detectors at CERN and part of them doesn't work, you can still get information from the other part. You're not happy, uh, but you can still use it with parts not working. This is more like the accelerator, actually. With ITER, if the whole thing doesn't work, it doesn't work. So it's complicated, and the, the technology, and it really is a big jump. And uh, it's a, I think it's harder, actually, and it's politically harder. I can tell you, part of the problems with ITER are, you know, a community which hasn't really worked on a global scale, trying to collaborate on a global project with government officials on the board who don't know much about projects and are trying to defend their national positions. It's not a good way to go. But it's nice to have it as a global project. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.